So let's summarize what we covered in Unit 6. Unit 6 was on generating power laws. Presented a number of different types of models that generate power laws. The first one is um, a, a version of a rich get richer model. And we can think of that as a procedure for growing a network. Um, so at each step, we have an existing network. At each step, we make one new node. And with probability p, we link to an existing node at random. But with probability 1 minus p, we link to a node with a probability proportional to that node's current number of inlinks. What that means is that nodes that are already popular or important, that have a number, um, large number linking to them, are more likely to be linked to. So we can start with uh, just a few nodes. Nothing is more popular than anything else, but those that by chance gain a little bit of additional popularity, that popularity will tend to grow and grow and grow. So popular nodes are favored, and then over time they become even more popular. And we see that as the network grows, the fraction of nodes with k in links turns out to follow a power law. And I didn't present the math behind this, but tried to at least make this plausible. So we can see that the distribution is approximately power law distributed with an exponent alpha that's related to p, the probability of um, whether or not you make a link at random or to one of the more popular ones. So these rich get richer models have many names. They're known as preferential attachment, preferential growth, sometimes the Matthew effect. And these models have a long and interesting history. They've been rediscovered um, a number of different times. Um, I think they're nice models, and they likely describe at least a portion of what gives rise to, it, to um, some of the power laws that we see, those that are maybe popularity-based. And it's a nice model because it describes, uh, I think in simple terms, a mechanism that's probably one of a number of things that, go, that um, occur in more complicated, complex systems. So then we considered um, a somewhat more abstract uh, gener uh, generating mechanism, combinations of exponentials. So the scenario here was, we have some quantity x that grows exponentially. But the ages of x themselves are exponentially distributed, which is something that we would expect if we had a memoryless process. If um, x, whatever it is, is created with fixed probability per unit time. So because all of these x's aren't the same age, there are going to be different sizes. And so what happens? Well, so we've got these x's growing exponentially with an exponent mu. The ages of t are distributed with an exponent nu. And so that, then the distribution of x, where x is the size of x, at time t, which is different because the ages are all different, then um, the distribution of x is going to be described by a power law with this exponent. So um, as I argued, this also seems like a plausible explanation for many power laws. It's a generic mechanism. One can come up with um, reasonable descriptions uh, or reasonable explanations for how this could apply to a number of different situations. So this also seems like a plausible and pretty general explanation. And I talked about log normal distributions and multiplicative processes. So first, a reminder about log normal distributions. That's the formula for them. It tells us how the random variable x is distributed. And in particular, if x is log normally distributed, then that means that the log of x is normally distributed. Um, so then we considered a, a simple multiplicative process. So we start with some x naught, and then we multiply a string of random variables together. These random variables are epsilon. And then we end up with another random variable at um, time t. And so then the question is, after this goes on for a while, after we multiply a bunch of these random numbers together, what would we get? Well, if we take the logarithm of both sides of this equation and use the log properties, we get to this, and 
I'm noticing a LaTeX mistake, but I can fix that on the fly. So this is the sum of log epsilon i, and i starts at 1 and ends at t. The versions of the slide that I post online, I'll correct this so there's not the scribble on it. So if we look at this term here, one between my fingers, that's the sum of a bunch of random variables. Epsilons are random, so log epsilons will be random too. And we know from the central limit theorem that the sum of random variables is Gaussian, is a normally distributed variable. So that means as t gets large, log of xt will be normally distributed. So if log of xt is normally distributed, then xt is log normally distributed. So this is a very easy way to get a log normally distributed variable. And one can imagine that this occurs very generically, any sort of multiplicative growth process that can happen. So some initial investment, and it grows by some percent, and some other percent, and some other percent. And those percents aren't the same every year, um, because it's, some, again, some sort of random process. And we can imagine cities growing this way, um, maybe organisms or number of species growing this way as well. So this is a very generic uh, process. But it's not a power law. It's log normal, which is related to a power law, but it's not the same thing. However, if we add a threshold to this system, so we modify this process in some way so that there's a lower threshold, and then that means that these x's, as we multiply again and again, cannot get arbitrarily close to zero. So I, as I said in the video before, I kind of think about this threshold as being something that as x grows and shrinks, grows and shrinks, bounces off of, and that sort of pushes the distribution out and gives it a long tail and a power law form instead of log normal. But again, power laws and log normals are similar. They're both long tail. They can be mistaken for each other. Um, so they're closely linked, not only because they happen to sort of look like each other, but they arise from very similar processes. So a multiplicative process, you throw in a little threshold, it turns a log normal into a power law. So then we talked about a very different way of generating power laws, and that's through optimization. And I gave um, three examples. So first, a distribution network, thinking about a transportation network or just trying to deliver water from a well to a number of homes. And there's a trade-off. There are two things you'll want to do. You'll want to minimize the number of hops, the number of stops um, that, the, that the system has to make, the number of, of plane changes or the number of houses along the way. Um, for the water, but you also want to minimize the total length, the amount of pipes, or the distance that the planes have to travel. And a reasonable balance between those two will very often give you a scale-free network. More generally, there's a model uh, or an approach known as highly optimized tolerance, and the idea there is to engineer systems to tolerate random failure. So we could think about a node in a network going down at random, or lightning occurring at random um, in a forest. Um, but otherwise be optimal. And so optimal, perhaps in this sense, might mean growing the most trees. And the trade-off between those two also tends to lead to a power law distribution, in this case, in the um, size of the random failures themselves, or the size of the uh, forest fires. And then I very briefly mentioned an approach due to Mandelbrot, which is a way to think about why um, there's a power law in word frequency. And that can, you can see, or one can argue, that that arises by minimizing the cost per unit information. So if you're trying, and trying to minimize the, the cost defined in some information theori theoretic way to um, convey a unit of information, um, that can give rise to the, um, a, a power law and word frequency. So I didn't go into these in any mathematical detail. But the main thing is that optimization can also give rise to power laws. And this is a very different way of thinking about power laws than probabilistic models. For example, the multiplicative process, which is just multiplying a bunch of random things together. Then the last idea I talked about was phase transitions. And so at the critical point of a con continuous phase transition, uh, many system properties are power laws. And the example that I gave was at the average cluster size and percolation, when you're right at that critical point, right um, posed at the poised at the transition, the average uh, cluster size 
obeys a power law. The exponents for these power laws are universal in um, a particular technical sense of universal from physics. So these exponents can't take on any old value. They belong to one of a small handful of universality classes. And these universality classes are determined largely by the dimension of the system and then also the um, symmetry or the nature of the uh, order parameter, the thing that's changing in the phase transition. And there's a powerful theory um, known as a renormalization group or renormalization theory that explains why this is so. And all told, the theory of phase transitions is a beautiful and successful theory. Successful because it explains a lot of um, seemingly different phenomena. And it's beautiful because there's a certain simplicity to it and some very elegant mathematics behind it. And so this drew um, physicists to it and perhaps led physicists to see power laws maybe when there weren't actually power laws all the time. So in my opinion, and I think this is uh, a statement that most who study complex systems would agree with, but not everyone. Um, in my opinion, phase transitions likely lie behind very few of the power laws observed in complex systems in the systems we've been looking at in this course. Um, why do I say that? Well, a phase transition is an unusual situation. It requires a parameter to be at or very near a very particular specific value. Whereas other mechanisms for power law generation that I presented are generic and apply um, to a wide range of parameter values. So multiplicative processes, you multiply together any old set of random variables with some very loose restrictions that those random variables are well behaved um, and put a lower threshold on it and you get a power law. It doesn't require any coincidence or fine tuning of your model. Additionally, I think for cultural reasons, physicists entirely understandably were drawn towards power laws and maybe tended to project power laws into situations where they shouldn't really have been projected. Or maybe it was merely a long tail distribution and not necessarily a power law. In any event, to summarize um, one more time, there are many different ways of generating power laws. If you observe a power law phenomena that doesn't really tell you that much about um, the, the mechanism that generated it, it makes a statement about certain empirical regularities in the data, and that can be very important and interesting in complex systems, but it doesn't point you necessarily towards a mechanism. So power laws are interesting, I think. They're long-tailed and they're scale-free, important and noteworthy. They're unusual, but they're not that unusual. They're somewhat common um, in the study of complex systems and, and other things, and even more common if I replaced power laws with long tails. So, um, and as we talked about in Unit 5, many empirical power laws may very well be log normal or something else. So sometimes things that are claimed to be power laws aren't actually power laws. Um, so knowing that something is power law distributed is interesting, but it does not imply any particular mechanism that generated it. So this brings us to the end of Unit 6. We've seen that there are many ways of making power laws. In the next two units, which are the last before we conclude the course and wrap things up, we'll look at two recent and I think very interesting examples of power laws and scaling applied to complex systems. First, we'll look at um, scaling in metabolic systems, and then we'll think about scaling in cities and urban systems. So, we'll see you next week.